one of the hot names in sports, Liam McHugh. He hosts the NHL pregame shows on NBC Sports Network, also does some other things on the network. He joined me on the Sports Buffet podcast to talk some general sports. We mentioned some hockey, we talked some hoops, and much, much more. Liam McHugh on the Sports Buffet podcast. Not very often can I say that people that work for NBC Sports Network were in my basement at one time, but Liam McHugh gets that honor, and it was willingly, by the way, not not a hostage situation. He joins me on the Sports Buffet podcast. We'll talk a lot with Liam in a little bit of time here. Let's start with the uh, NHL playoffs, though, Liam. It seems like, you know, an eight seed in the NHL or NBA playoffs can make some noise and get to the finals. But I don't know if anybody's done it lately as dominant as the L.A. Kings have done it so far. What's going right for the Kings? Oh, this point, just about everything. Uh, in fact, uh, by the way, first of all, great introduction. Um, the first ever time I've uh, uh, heard the basement reference I in the introduction. I wa- it was willingly watching boxing. Uh, but we, uh, everything's going right for this team. I mean, you have an AC that is now 15-2 and two in the playoffs. Uh, you know, if they finish 16-2, and two, it'll be the most dominant run ever tying them with the, uh, you know, 88 Oilers. But, uh, and even last, you know, the one thing that wasn't going well for them was the power play, and then they scored two power play goals last night. This is a team with a ton of talent. I mean, yeah, they were an eight seed, but, you know, when I talked to the guys, when I talked to Keith Jones and Mike Melberry and Jeremy Roenick, they all say the same thing. This is not a decent team that just got hot at the right time. This is a very, very talented team that finally just had it all come together at the right time. Uh, you know, and it could be the type of team that we look to, you know, for years now as, uh, you know, one of the dominant teams in the NHL. And the bottom line is this, when you have a goaltender like Jonathan Quick, who has given up two goals in three Stanley Cup final games, and when you consider two of them went to overtime, so even more minutes on the ice, uh, you're going to be in every game. He's going to give you a chance to win. And I think we're looking at the guy who's probably going to be the starting goaltender for Team USA in the next one. Coming into the, uh, once I guess the playoffs got started, uh, who did you see the Kings playing in the Stanley Cup Finals? Did the Devils getting there surprise you? I think the Devils surprised everyone a little bit. I mean, it, you know, they're a good team. I, uh, you know, they were in a good spot, I think a lot of people felt, because they, uh, even though they were six seed, they were getting a third seed team in Florida that a lot of people thought that they could beat. Uh, I thought Pittsburgh would have been a team that could have given them trouble, but Philadelphia took care of Pittsburgh, so that worked out well for them. And then they just matched up really well with the Rangers. So, I mean, while they're a very good team, the matchups certainly worked out well for them. Uh, I think the, the surprise for them is goaltending also. I mean, get a guy in Marty Brodeur, who, you know, many people consider the greatest goalie ever, but he's a 40-year-old guy, turned 40 during the playoffs, and, you know, until last night, I would say he played. he's played better since turning 40 than he did throughout the entire season. Uh, makes it feel like he's probably going to come back next year the way he's playing right now. So, you know, I certainly didn't expect them to be in the final. I thought the Rangers would be right in the mix. I, like most people, I, I thought coming into the way the regular season ended, I thought Pittsburgh was going to storm its way into the finals. And the fact that they, uh, you know, fizzled out at the beginning was probably that's the biggest surprise. That and the Kings making the two biggest surprises in the playoffs. Can can Martin Brodeur be a trendsetter to where he can get other uh, older guys out of retirement now to get back between the pipes? <laughs> yeah, I don't know about that. Uh, um, I heard rumors. Yeah, I mean it's always possible, and I think people, you know, I think if you're around that age and you see what he's doing right now, you start to think, why not? You know, uh, this is a guy. Especially, I mean, there were times during the regular season where you know Marty looked like. It was time for him to call it quits. You know, he'd have some moments and have some games where he just looked like he looked old, he looked slow. Uh, the reflexes just weren't there. Uh, you know, he'd have mental mistakes handling the puck that led to really, really ugly goals. Uh, but the way he put this all together and turned things around, you know what, why not? I mean, and I'm, uh, I think it, it's in hockey, it's in soccer. I think, you know, John quick's young, but I think for goaltenders, your prime age is older. I mean, because it is such a mental game to be a goaltender. Two more NHL questions real quick. Uh, do any of the coaching changes that have happened either recently or since the playoffs have ended surprise you? And, you know, it seems like the NHL doesn't like bad pub, but anytime there is a hit of a monstrous uh, 
proportion like there was in the Chicago Phoenix series, it gets people talking. Uh, talk a little bit about that hit with uh, with Torres as well. Yeah, uh, yeah. Well, so they. I mean, I think Torres. Uh, you have a guy who's uh, clearly a repeat offender. You know, a guy who's been worn, fined, suspended by the league. Uh, and anytime you go high and you hit a guy, uh, you know, they suspend him, but Hose is out. And Hose is a big star. It's, it's clearly not an equal trade on the ice. I think the NHL has done a, you know, a, a good job in terms of deciding that there are hits they really want to eliminate in the league. And that was a textbook hit. Uh, they, they want to get rid of that. And to do that, you have to send strong messages, and that's exactly what they did to Torres. Uh, you know, they sat him down for the rest of the playoffs. And uh, I think they're headed in the right direction right now. You know, they, they realize the concussion issue is such a serious issue in all sports. Um, you know, and it was really under the microscope this year because of the Sidney Crosby situation. And I think Brendan Shanahan, the league, Brendan Shanahan's got a tough job. A lot of people knocked him. You know, people said some rulings are inconsistent. It's a thankless job. I think he does a good job at it. Um, and I, I really I really do think the NHL, uh, what they've done this year, the statements they've made, and the, you know, the suspensions they've handed out, it'll only be good for the game in the future. Yeah, because when I saw that hit, I mean, I kind of go back a, a little bit of old school. You know, I, it didn't remind me exactly 100% of what Dale Hunter did to uh, Pierre Turgeon in 93, but, yeah. you know, it was it was sort of somewhat on the level, and now Dale Hunter is uh, is jobless as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it, it reminded a few people of that. Um, yeah, and, uh, yeah, I mean, you talk about coaching changes, and, you know, Dale Hunter's gone uh, from Washington, and, uh, you know, I, I think a lot of people, it, it's funny, you talk to Keith Jones, he knows Dale Hunter pretty well from his time with Caps, and uh, he had been saying this all along, because uh, to me it seemed that if the Caps made the run, made any kind of run in the playoffs, they'd really do everything they could to keep Dale Hunter around. Uh, and, uh, Jonesy was telling me the whole time that, you know, he's the type of guy who just doesn't need this. You know, it, it's wear and tear and it's aggravation, and he has his junior team uh, that he owns and runs, and it's right by his hometown. He loves doing it, and he'd like to go home for that. And I just didn't buy it. I always think that if you can have a marquee job at the top level, you know, you, you run with it. Uh, but I think at the end of the year, he realized, you know, I've come in, I did my part, I'm ready to move, I'm ready to go back home. It's, uh, uh, and he just doesn't need this, and I, I give him credit. You know, uh, I think a lot of people would just stick around because it's the NHL. But uh, he, uh, you know, he did things his way with Washington. Um, they got, you know, they played defensive hockey. They made it ugly at times. It wasn't Alexander Ovechkin's team anymore. It was Dale Hunter's team. And you got to give him credit because they were successful. They put, you know, pushed the Rangers right to the brink. We'll do a little bit of a quick blitz now in just terms of uh, general sports. Uh, I know probably you don't get to see as much of the NBA playoffs with the crossing up with hockey, but uh, your thoughts so far on the uh, two series that we have left with the Spurs and Thunder and the Heat and the Celtics? Yeah, I don't think I get to see as much of it as I would like to, but uh, yeah, from what I've seen, uh, I'll start with the, the West. I mean, San Antonio's run, uh, their streak was amazing, and now to see... Oklahoma City, a young team, not only take those two at home, but then take another one on the road. Uh, it's impressive, and, you, and you're really seeing. Uh, I had the privilege of covering Kevin Durant when he was in college in Texas. And, you know, uh, the, the talent was so obvious. Uh, he was one of those guys that he knew was going to be a star in the league. Uh, but, you know, to see him develop now into a guy who, who's taken that talent and uh, is willing to put a team on his back in the playoffs and carry them at times. Uh, it, it's pretty amazing. Uh, you know, I think you're seeing, you know, a guy who's going to be one of the top two players in the league for the next decade. Uh, he, he's, he's a matchup nightmare, almost seven feet tall. He can move and dribble, uh, you know, and get to the hole and, you know, bury threes. Uh, and the funny thing is, um, how much better I actually think LeBron is uh, than Durant. I, I think Durant's a wonderful player, but I think LeBron is... Uh, He's just uh, in another level. He's, a, he's on another planet with, with all the various skills, especially the fact that now he... The things that they said he didn't do in the postseason last year, you know, go into the post, command the ball, uh, get tough at times, defend different guys. He's willing to do it all now, and he's doing it so well. Uh, don't love his complete supporting cast with Miami. Right. You know? uh, don't, can't say 
say that I love the big guys that they have. Um, I mean, the simple fact that they had to have him guard Garnett at times, you know, so, so all you need to know about uh, his supporting cast down there. But, uh, uh, I well, love, uh, and you know, I mean, one, one thing. Admit, wouldn't, you, wouldn't you love to see Heat, the Heat play uh, the Thunder in the finals? As long as Heat lose, I don't care who they play in the finals. But, uh, what, you know, one thing I would like to say, as much as people have been, uh, you know, poo-pooing on Chris Bosh this whole time, I think they see how badly they need at least Chris Bosh to stay around because, uh, you know, who is Joel Anthony, Udonis Haslam, and yeah. Juwan Howard at this point? I mean, you know, Juwan Howard back in the day, yeah. stud. I, I could believe Juwan Howard's still on the roster. No, no nor, yeah. nor can I. I mean, you know, I'm waiting for yeah. Jimmy King and Ray Jackson to pop back out, too. <laughs> but, but, I mean, yeah. you know, and, and you got to think, too, is this it for the Celtics? Because they're old. Oh, yeah. I mean, uh, you got to figure this is it for the Celtics uh, in terms of, you know, the big three aren't going to be the big three anymore. Uh, I can't imagine that Ray Allen's back next year. Um, you know, this is clearly becoming Rondo's team. Uh, it is Rondo's team at this point. You know, uh, uh, it, this is their last run. Um, you know, I think I expected a little bit more out of Paul Pierce. Yeah, I agree. Do you, do you feel that way? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. You know, if you look at the points and what he's done in the playoffs, I mean, it's, a, it's, it's crazy to think, but, you know, even with the franchise, with all the history of the Celtics, he's going to go down as one of their greatest players ever. Um, and I, I think I just expected a little bit more, and I, I wonder, you know, these guys aren't young, and if it's all the wear and tears is catching up to them. Johan Santana throws the first no-hitter in the history of the New York Mets after uh, multiple people have gone on to throw no-hitters after leaving the Metropolitans. Uh, and he has two complete games this year, which I found... Astounding when I saw that stat. Uh, Johan Santana, I mean, could this be a rebirth for him, so to speak, too? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, it, it's funny. We, as Mets fans, uh, uh, you know, I, I talked to my dad immediately right after the, the no-hitter. We didn't speak during it, uh, you know, because you go over 8,000 games without having a no-hitter. No one wants to talk during it. Uh, uh, and, you know, I mean, it, it goes back and Nolan Ryan, you know, he's a Met, he gets traded, and the curse of Nolan Ryan begins. He throws seven no-hitters, the Mets throw none. Uh, you know, Tom Seaver, you know, comes within and out of throwing a no-hitter for the Mets. That doesn't happen. He moves, he leaves the Mets, he throws a no-hitter. Uh, you know, I'm glad, I'm obviously glad that it happened. I'm glad that it, uh, it was Joanne Santana, uh, you know, pitcher of his caliber. That it wasn't just a footnote, some journeyman guy who happened to, you know, catch lightning in a bottle one night. Uh, the problem, that Mets fans have now is uh, we're all miserable. We all think something horrible is going to happen. So now we're all worried that this guy who had surgery to repair his arm has thrown, you know, he throws over 130 pitches for a no-hitter. He throws back-to-back complete games. Now we're all waiting for something awful to happen. You know, something, we're waiting to hear bad news about John Santana. Right. Uh, this is the way Mets fans operate. I mean, as much as we enjoyed the moment, you know, almost immediately after, we're all sitting there, oh, God, you know, something terrible must be coming our way next. Well, and I don't think, uh, you know, maybe maybe that could be the Philadelphia Phillies because I don't think most people would say the New York Mets would have been ahead of the Phillies at this point in the season, in the standings. No, no. And, and you know, it's, I think you, you have to be realistic about the situation. Uh, you know, your number one Santana, your number two is Dickey. Uh, yeah, and Dickie's a great story, and he's a he's a nice pitcher, but he's still you know he's a knuckleballer, it's a number two guy, and then after that, it's a it's a big drop off. Uh, I don't know. I I would be surprised if we were having this type of a conversation about the Mets in September. I'd be surprised if we're having this type of conversation about the Mets uh, come July fourth, almost. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, it, yeah. it, and you know, if I'm a Phillies fan, I'm I'm concerned. You should be. Uh, I mean, you I'm know, not, because I'm not a Philly fan. But if I was, I yeah. would be. No, yeah. I mean, it's a mess. I mean, right. and uh, you know, it's a team that was built, you know, built to win now, and it, it's an absolute mess. Um, and and the division, you know, on top of it, it, you know, it's definitely doubled because you consider how much tougher the division is than what people thought. I mean, the Mets were a complete afterthought. Uh, you know, uh, I think everyone thought we play, you play the Mets, it's like having a weekend off. I think, you know. Nobody thought the Nationals would be this good this fast. Um, and obviously, you have a Miami team that's talented. Uh, you know, Philly's in trouble. It's 
funny. I mean, it's amazing to think Philly's in some trouble. The Yankees are in some trouble. Um, it's still early. It's a lot of time for talented teams to sort things out. My one question about the Nationals is they've talked about there is a uh, limit with Steven Strasburg and so forth. If that team is in contention come September, do they shut him down? Uh, that's that's been you know sort of a mission statement out there. That this is what they're going to do. They're sticking with it. They want to. Uh, I uh, I wonder if people you know in that franchise are saying they are. And playing both sides of it, like hoping, yeah, you know, I hope we're in it, and I hope we're in the mix, and that people are so interested in buying tickets to come to the park. But God, I really don't want him to be the guy who makes that decision. Right. To shut him down. Uh, you know, the, I don't know. I, 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 in a way, I mean, I hope they're in it just because I want to see this play out. Don't you? I mean, oh, I absolutely. See, I, I mean, and you know, Strasburg's not going to want to be shut down. This guy's ultra competitive. Uh, you know, I watched him pitch against the Mets earlier in the season. And, you know, he, he had a, you know, a long inning, but he let up no runs. But he didn't have great command of his stuff, and he comes in, you know, back into the dugout. He's fired up, and he's angry at himself, he's cursing. Uh, and, you know, that was after one inning where he didn't let up any runs. So, you can imagine, I, I can't imagine how he's going to handle this if they're right in the mix, and they're telling him, yep, you're done. Well, uh, what if they never get back to that point? I know. You know, that's how I don't know how you can do it. There's no guarantee. Yep. There's, there's certainly no guarantee. I would like to close up shop, as always, talking uh, boxing. Uh, Kelly Pavlik makes his uh, return this week. Uh, obviously, we saw Kelly Pavlik when he was at his height. Does he have anything left in the tank, in your opinion? I don't know. I hope so. Um, y- you know, that's, it's one of those, my my, uh, my heart says yes, my head says probably not. Uh um, you know he's fighting a guy from Lynchburg, though. Is he real? Yeah. He's well, uh, Friday night fight. Him. Friday night fights. He's fighting a guy named uh, Scott Sigmund, who has lost about two or three fights. And I mean, Scott Sigmund really called Kelly Pavlik out and got the fight on Friday night fights. Is uh, Kelly Pavlik's kind of uh, resurgence and comeback with a new trainer now in Robert Garcia? Yeah, it's a little bit easier to call Kelly Pavlik out now than Kelly Pavlik out about six years ago. Oh, yeah, I think the, yeah. the Bernard Hopkins fight, I think, uh, swung the... Because, uh, you know, I think everybody expected Kelly Pavlik to crush old man Hopkins, and uh, Bernard of just course. took him to school. Yeah, yeah, that, uh, that showed a lot of people a lot about Kelly Pavlik. And it's, listen, I mean, it, it, you know, it's a shame. Uh, I hope he comes back, and I hope he fights well. I don't think... I don't know how you feel. I don't think we're ever going to see the Pavlik that we saw before the Hopkins fight, though. No, and, and, you know, I mean, I think, too, is this uh, should also classify of how good was Jermaine Taylor ever. Because you know, I, I mean, think that's a question. Right. I, I agree with that. I, I think that's a big question. Um, there are a lot of people who really wanted to jump on, you know, the Jermaine Taylor bandwagon uh, and crown this guy as, you know, one of the great fighters right now and, and, and all of boxing and, you know, will be for a long time. Um, and, and I'm not sure I really ever bought into that, but... Uh, I will say this. I mean, the Kelly Pavlik Jermaine Taylor fight where, you know, Pavlik was, you know, completely out on his feet. Yep. And came back, you know, to just pummel Taylor uh, was one of the greatest fights I've ever seen in my life. And then Shane Mosley and Winky Wright both retire on the same day. Uh, both will probably be Hall of Famers. Uh, who do you have more vivid memories of, Shane or Winky? Definitely Shane. Um, you know, uh, uh, so a lot of big fights. I remember, God, it's, it's amazing to think that I remember when he was a young fighter. Um, right. Uh, uh, you know, up and coming. And I, I just really remember, especially when he was young, uh, he had just incredible hand speed. You know, uh, and he was, he was a charismatic guy. Uh, uh, you know, I, I don't know. Do you think a lot of people have great memories of Winky Wright? Uh, I mean, he's a great <laughs> boxer, but do you think there are really those moments? You, you know, the best fight I can think of with Winky Wright that I saw was probably the one against Jermaine Taylor. That was a draw yeah. on, my, on my birthday, as a matter of fact. So <laughs> that's the best. I mean, you know, Shane, I don't know if you've seen Shane's last few fights against Pacquiao and Canelo, but it was time for Shane to go. It does point. I mean, this, this could not continue. And uh, finally, that brings us to Manny Pacquiao and Timothy Bradley this weekend. Who do you like in that one? I like Manny Pacquiao. I mean, uh, at this point, uh, uh, you know, it's, I, I think it's it's two twofold. It's uh, you know, a, a 
hey, I can't go against the guy who's boxed as well as he has in the past, and I, I can't, I sort of just want to, I want him to keep playing because I want to at least keep the dream alive that we'll see Manny and Mayweather at some point, sometime. I think our paths might cross again in person before Manny and Floyd. <laughs> you think so? Because I have that. Well, I mean, for one, I wonder is HBO pay per view beamed to the uh, Las Vegas County Jail, so Floyd can, <laughs> yeah. so Floyd can scout the fight. But uh, I don't know. I mean, you remember I I used to be you know just as gung ho. It's gonna happen next fall, and that was about three falls ago. So I just I know. I'm, I've lost hope. Well, and I, I think it's also one of those things where. Um, I think we'll see it at some point. I just hope that it happens uh, while these guys are still at an age where I care about it. Right. It, yeah, um, it could be too you know, late. Exactly. I think mm-hmm. I, I think we'll see it. I think it's going to happen. I just, you know, I don't want it to be when both these guys are knocking on 40 and need a paycheck. Right, right. right. Well. Uh, so they decide, oh, remember that fight that everyone wanted to see a decade ago? <laughs> well, here you go, and it's $80. Well, I, I definitely admire your optimism, but... I, can, I unfortunately cannot share in it, but uh, Liam, as always, we appreciate the time. Enjoy the rest of the Stanley Cup, and uh, what what does NBC Sports Net have you doing next? What's where can we catch Liam McHugh uh, pretty soon? Uh, in about three weeks, I will uh, be headed over to France for the uh, Tour de France. Uh, I'll be there for uh, about a month, and then the day after that ends, I will be at the Olympics. Wow! Thing for NBC Sports Network, so I'll be uh, I'll be in Europe. In one city or another for uh, two months this summer, so it's uh, it's going to be a long trip. I'm really excited. I'm very very pumped up for the Olympics. I'm a huge Olympics fan. Uh, so it's uh, you know, growing up. My dad's a track coach. He ran in college. Uh, my brother's a, a runner. So big Olympics household. So I'm extremely excited for that. I got to be honest with you. I'm much more excited about the Olympics than the Tour de France. Well, I think I think you're probably in the majority. You you yeah. you would have to sell me on. You would have to sell me on. I mean, I might watch a Tour de France just to get my Liam McHugh fix, but otherwise, you know, <laughs> it, it, the Tour it, just doesn't. A, you know, it, it's uh, it, it's a very unique event. It's uh, uh, you know, it's not an enormous fan base, but the fan base we have is a devout fan base, and it's just a little bit different now that it's not the Lance Armstrong days. Right, no, no, uh, no yellow jersey on Lance these days, at all. Yeah. Well, Liam, we will catch up with you hopefully when you get back from the pond and uh, safe travels, and we will see you on NBC Sportsnet. All right, sounds good. Thanks, Bob.